Well, um, on behalf of my tech, the MIT Activities Committee, uh, we are thrilled to welcome Uli Lorimer today from um, Director of Horticulture at the Garden in the Woods, um, the Native Plant Trust's um, 45 acre botanical garden, um, which is dedicated to the flora of New England. Um, and uh, Uli today will talk about just some of the, the visual beauty of Garden in the Woods, um, along with um, the Native uh, Plant Trust work and plant conservation and public education. And um, with that, I will have um, Uli uh, take us away on a beautiful tour of Garden in the Woods today on a, a gorgeous July day. Um, so uh, Uli, um, Welcome and um, take us away. Uh, welcome everyone um, to a, uh, a season at Garden in the Woods. Um, so for those of you who are un unfamiliar with Garden in the Woods, Garden in the Woods is located in Framingham, Massachusetts. It's the headquarters for Native Plant Trust um, that was formerly known as the New England Wildflower Society. Uh, before that, the New England uh, Wildflower Preservation Society, um, and a few other names. Um, and we are the oldest plant conservation organization in the country, uh, founded in 1900. Um, and our um, headquarters, like I said, are here in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, a little bit about the history of the property itself. Um, it was uh, purchased in 1931 by a landscape architect named Will Curtis, um, who was uh, very taken by the site topography. Um, it is um, a, a landscape that was influenced by the last glacier. So we have uh, a little esker, what we call the plateau, where uh, most of the buildings, the parking lots are, and then the bulk of the gardens are uh, about a hundred feet below the Esker uh, with some rather steep sided little valleys and there are some naturally occurring ponds and wetlands, uh, a stream that runs through the back of the property. Um, and so in 1931, um, uh, Will Curtis purchased the property, uh, built a cabin on site and began um, working on the garden. Um, he was one of the earlier proponents of uh, sort of a naturalistic garden design. Uh, and worked with others like Warren Manning um, and um, Frederick Olmsted. Um, the garden uh, was um, continued to be developed by uh, Will Curtis and his partner uh, Dick Stiles um, all the way up through until the 19, early 1960s when it was formally given to uh, then the New England uh, Wildflower Preservation Society. Um, so and since then uh, has continued to be developed and, and uh, um, is the garden that you see today. So uh, in thinking about how to, um, how to present a, a virtual tour of it, what I thought to do was to go through um, the seasons um, and specifically all 12 months that we have here in the garden and to show a little bit about what goes on at these different months and to talk about the organization a little bit along the way. So we'll start in January, um, and this is a rather typical scene here in January with uh, some of our rhododendrons uh, looking cold. Um, rhododendrons uh, and a number of different plants have these really wonderful adaptations for um, surviving the winter. And so it's not just adaptations for cold, but also adaptations for um, retaining water. It's probably one of the most important things for plants to be able to do. So. The, 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 uh, what I call nature's thermometer are rhododendron leaves. When uh, the temperatures get below freezing, the leaves uh, droop and they curl inwards, uh, all in an effort to reduce exposed surface area. And it's a process known as thermonasty. Um, the beech tree that you can see here holds on to its leaves a little bit, um, which uh, again, helps to reduce wind speeds and water loss around the buds and so forth. Um, bark certainly also something that's uh, really important for trees uh, to make sure that the interior stay nice and moist and it, it repels any kinds of attacks. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about sugar as an antifreeze. So um, 
there's lots of beautiful buds uh, and little details even in the winter to be found. Um, our Viburnum lantanoides or hobble bush has these really wonderful, almost like a pair of seal flippers, uh, uh, wonderful little buds that are covered in a very dense uh, uh, pubescence. Um, and the prickly pear, and again, many people are, are surprised to learn that we actually have a native prickly pear. Um, the prickly pear has this wonderful adaptation for the winter. Um, and what it does is uh, ahead of the cold periods, um, it will pump water out of those pads. And by doing so, it concentrates sugars inside. And so the pads themselves look kind of wrinkled and sad and they lay flat on the ground. But by concentrating the sugars, they're lowering the freezing point of the, re the remaining water that's in those fleshy leaves. And it allows them to survive temperatures as low as negative 20 to negative 30 degrees without any damage to the tissue. Um, and again, once the, uh, once the warm weather resumes, they take up water again, the pads will sit upright uh, and it'll flower and it's a really wonderful plant. Um, but it's just a neat, I think a really amazing way that nature has evolved to deal with the tough period for many plants. Um, the life, the garden is not, of course, completely devoid of any life. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, direct sightings of things. Uh, this particular, uh, this past January, we had uh, a, a very interested barred owl that would sit outside of folks' offices and peer inside and look around and didn't seem too shy. And then after snowfalls, you certainly get to see a lot of animal tracks, whether they're fox, um, fisher cat, or in this case, coyote. Um, so there's definitely signs that, uh, that there's life in the garden, even though most of the plants are, um, are dormant or asleep, as we might say. February brings more snowfall, so uh, really wonderful times to kind of go around the garden, and particularly with, with heavy wet snow, um, which I like because it really highlights the branch architecture. Uh, and so this is our little lily pond looking out over it after a particularly deep uh, snowfall. And even the way that it accents the, the, um, the lines and the structure and the habit of certain trees like our sassafras that has these really wonderful little scalloped branching habit um, that I think is just really great. There are little bits of color and flashes of interest here and there, mostly in the way of the color of bark or uh, some of the details that you might find on some of the lichens either growing on our rocks or uh, on, the, on the barks of trees. But, March brings reason to be happy. Um, and one of my favorite, uh, as far as buds go, uh, is the butternut, because um, it looks like a cheerful little fellow who's smiling. And um, at this stage, um, you can also see the little proto leaves uh, coming up at the top there. And this little guy is really telling you, um, don't be worried, spring is on its way. Um, and it's a really wonderful, cheerful sign. But for me, the emergence of skunk cabbage is a real true sign that uh, spring is on its way and that the season will resume. Um, skunk cabbage is an, is an interesting plant in that it has uh, these really kind of otherworldly looking flowers. Um, and inside of those flowers, the plant has the ability to um, maintain an, a, a temperature inside of the flowers that can be 10 to 15 degrees warmer than ambient temperatures. And it's, uh, again, it's an adaptation to release its, its scent um, and uh, as a place to, um, for early emerging flies and beetles to um, find safe harbor uh, during cold nights. Um, there's a great deal of variation in these flowers, as you can see, uh, and really wonderful uh, kinds of markings. Um, no two are exactly alike, and again, this is Part, part of uh, what we celebrate at, at, at Garden in the Woods, um, you know, we are an organization that um, champions the flora, uh, the preservation and use of the flora of New England. Um, and uh, we really value um, species of plants and genetic diversity because, um, you know, genetic diversity is, is, is a little bit of a, an abstract concept for most folks. Um, but one that uh, underpins the plant's abilities to um, be able to adapt and change in a very change, fast changing climate. Um, visually, what it represents uh, are not uniform clones of one another, something that you might get from growing plants from cuttings, for example, but you get variation and variation in the way in that those genes are expressed. And it's really wonderful to see that. And we'll, 
we'll look at those examples again and again throughout the talk. Um, our amphibious life also begins to slowly emerge at this time. Uh, again, depending on the weather, you might uh, turn over a, a lethargic wood frog um, who uh, is just kind of waking up and, and, and wanting to begin um, it's it's a season of calling and mating and, and cruising around. Um, it's also a time where buds begin to swell. We begin to see the first sort of fuzzy emergences of our willows, in this case, the black pussy willow. Um, and still a time when moss uh, is sort of the greenest thing on the landscape in the larger sense. There still can be, you know, snowy times in March, little dustings of snow here and there. Um, but again, if you look at this plant uh, and look at it again as that, that you know, um, natural thermometer, I can tell just by looking at that it's barely freezing. It's not, as, not nearly as cold as those other pictures were. Um, so again, lots of little details, um, you know, the, the emergence of sedge flowers, you might even get to see some, uh, some, some um, salamander or newt activity uh, that's beginning to pop up. And finally, towards the end of March, we actually begin to see the emergence of foliage and some of our earlier flowering uh, uh, spring flowers. Um, the cohoshes here um, uh, emerge out of the ground with these really deep, deep purple leaves that almost look sort of ethereal and otherworldly, uh, along with uh, the sort of purple hues and green hues of some of the uh, earlier meadow roos and phylicterums. And it's also a great time to look for the state flower of Massachusetts, which is Epigea repens, the trailing arbutus. Um, this flower has pretty tough little, uh, tough little foliage and really wonderfully fragrant flowers. Um, but we oftentimes uh, refer to them as belly plants because you have to get down on your, uh, literally onto your belly to smell it. It's a pretty, pretty prostrate and low growing plant. So April, again, coaxes a little bit more life out into our pond here. We uh, usually have a, a, a good amount of painted turtles that are out there looking to sun themselves. Um, this is a view looking at one of the ridges with our lily pond off to the, to the right. Uh, and the trail that goes to the left is called uh, Laurel Bend. Um, and that uh, sort of separates one of the natural uh, uh, wetlands on the right-hand side uh, in ponds with some of the other sections. Um, and again, you know, even though the trees haven't leafed out yet and there's still that, that feeling like it's still uh, um, late winter uh, and early April, um, there is wonderful signs of life to be found. Um, again, turkeys coming around, garter snakes emerging because it's finally warm enough. Green frogs are joining the wood frogs and the spring peepers uh, in, in, the, in the wet areas and the ponds. And we're beginning to see some of our woody plants uh, beginning to bloom. So red maples here, um, a really wonderful plant called uh, leatherwood that has uh, incredibly flexible branches. Um, and one of our native um, honeysuckles, um, the American fly honeysuckle, one of the first ones to bloom. Then we get to see things like anemone um, and uh, with its little uh, um, uh, sharp little leaves. Uh, one of my favorites are bluets or Quaker ladies. Um, this is a plant that uh, is probably mostly familiar to folks that if you've grown up in New England, it's very ubiquitous along roadsides and trail sides. Um, you know, uh, authors of the last century, you know, late, late, uh, um, 19th century, early 20th century, talk about uh, the abundance of this plant growing. Uh, so it, it, it lended the appearance of, of early meadows as being dusted with snow because of the amount of uh, the, these cheerful little flowers that are here. Um, and so uh, we try to work with and, um, and encourage these little guys to come and, and be cheerful at this time of year as much as possible. It's also a wonderful time in Eastern woodlands for the emergence of spring ephemerals. And spring ephemerals are a group of plants um, that are pretty characteristic to the Eastern seaboard here um, and are, are called ephemeral because they emerge before the trees leaf out uh, and they more or less complete their life cycle, or at least their above ground life cycle um, by the time June rolls around uh, and they've melted away and gone dormant again and you have to wait all the way until April to see them again. And so things like our uh, Dutchman's breeches and squirrel corn, the trout lilies, um, 
but Mr. Curtis uh, in, in his uh, uh, original garden um, applied a much larger or different definition of native to uh, what we consider today to be appropriate. Um, and he grew many special plants that uh, are originally from the Southern Appalachians, uh, including uh, what you see in the bottom right here, which is Shortia or Akani bells. Uh, and this is a very rare plant. It's endemic to a, a small region of the Southern Appalachians. Um, but we've grown it now for nearly 70 or 80 years and have some really delightfully nice patches of it uh, in what we call a Curtis's woodland. Now is also the time for trilliums to begin to emerge. Um, here you see a great example of our, our, um, one of the trilliums that, is, uh, that you can find out in the woods here in New England. Um, and it gets a wonderful name called Stinking Benjamin uh, because the flowers don't smell good. Um, some parts of the country, this plant is referred to as the wet dog trillium. Um, um, as you can imagine, it, it uh, um, probably smells a little bit like that. Um, and its reason is that its main pollinator are fungus gnats and things that would be attracted to uh, that deep red color and um, what would maybe be akin to a rotting smell uh, at that time in the woods. Um, Bloodroot is another uh, wonderful spring ephemeral that's uh, uh, the foliage is just starting to melt now a little bit and we've got lots of good displays of bloodroot along with some very special ones, uh, some double flowered bloodroots um, that have a, have a kind of a great story in themselves and that um, this plant was first discovered in a uh, growing in Ontario in Canada um, and um, all of the uh, double flowered blood roots that are that exist are direct descendants of this one patch and as it doesn't have any uh, reproductive parts they've been sort of swapped out for more petals um, it needs to be propagated by division or cuttings and so um, you can kind of you know directly trace the lineage of all these plants to the discovery of this double flowered one in Canada in the mid 50s. So May uh, really brings an absolute explosion of flowers and color and interest into the garden. Uh, and it's probably the one month that we're most known for, uh, and particularly here in the Curtis Woodland. Um, that's where our visitorship is the highest um, and tends to coincide with uh, Easter and Mother's Day. Uh, and there's lots of good reason for it uh, because we have lots of really wonderful, wonderful plants that are here. So up on the plateau here, we've got our white walk, uh, which was originally designed to have all white flowered uh, uh, perennials and, and trees and shrubs, uh, although we have allowed some other colors to come in. Um, but you get a little bit of a sense of the fact that, you know, we really favor very dense plantings. Uh, we don't use a whole lot of mulch. Uh, we rather, rather cover the ground with uh, as many plants as possible, some combinations of ferns and, and lots of other things. And here we are looking uh, back at some of the administrative and education buildings off in the distance uh, at the same time. Um, we have an idea garden, uh, which features a sedge lawn and a um, wild strawberry lawn. So to give people some ideas about lawn alternatives um, and ways that you might be able to reduce your lawn surfaces uh, and plants that might be uh, uh, something that you could use um, to replace lawns with. Um, just as an aside, um, you know, there seems to be a great amount of interest uh, in, in the, uh, recently um, in folks shrinking their lawns. Um, lawns are very water thirsty. Um, people put far too many per pesticides and fertilizers on them than what is needed. Um, and they're very resource intensive to manage and to keep. Um, and a lawn like this, for example, um, you could mow it maybe once or twice a year It'll take foot traffic, doesn't need any fertilization, it requires no pesticides whatsoever, and very little water once it's established. Um, one thing I can say that we're very proud of here is that we don't use any pesticides whatsoever for the entire 45 acre garden. We also don't use any fertilizers uh, and really only water when we're planting new things uh, or in extreme drought situations. Um, and so we sort of pride ourselves in picking the right spots for the plants that we like to grow so that they'll grow uh, unaided by us as much as possible. So now we're gonna be sort of descending in off the plateau into the Curtis Woodland and we can begin to see some of the really wonderful combinations of creeping flocks here and ferns 
and trilliums, uh, along with some of the Southern Appalachian or Piedmont uh, rhododendrons that you can see here. Um, this particular garden, uh, just behind the pink, uh, pink rhododendrons there was where Curtis's cottage had stood. It has now been uh, uh, taken down. Um, but this whole section here has a couple of different plaques that are dedicated to Curtis and his vision, uh, not only for this piece of property, but for the organization and for what he had hoped uh, would happen in New England around um, plant conservation. So um, our, uh, this time we've got some of the earlier flowering uh, rhododendrons here and azaleas. The pink shell azalea is another Southern Appalachian plant, um, but one of the first ones to bloom for us up here. Um, along with a white version of it. We have other woodies like fringe tree, which is incredibly fragrant. Uh, and in the wetter areas, the mountain witch alder. Um, the woodland itself features these big drifts and sweeps of creeping flocks and foam flower. So the foam flower here in a little more detail uh, is a really delightful uh, uh, um, perennial of, of moist uh, shaded areas. And then these different creeping flocks with foam fires and Sherwood purple are the two cultivars of these natives that we use. There's lots of other colorful things at this point too that aren't necessarily spring ephemeral. So uh, our native columbine has this uh, really wonderfully complex flower uh, with the long nectar spurs and is something that will draw in um, hummingbirds if they're around at this point or any sort of butterfly that has a, a tongue long enough to get in there. Um, other nice ground covers like the green and gold and things like Jacob's Ladder uh, in our meadow sections, uh, we've got sundial lupins um, and ditch stone crops and a really wonderful rare plant called painted cup. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about rare plants in a minute. Uh, Garden in the Woods maintains a, uh, an accredited um, uh, or nationally accredited collection of trilliums. Uh, and so usually the first or second week of May, we celebrate trillium week. Uh, where we've got an entire week of programming and events centered around and celebrating our collection. Um, we grow about 35 to 40 different taxa of trilliums. So these include uh, uh, species, uh, um, subspecies and varieties, uh, some cultivated forms, some hybrids, uh, and trilliums that uh, would be found as far uh, west as the Ozarks, all the way into the southeast, and all the way into the ones that we could find here in the northeast as well. Um, so aside from the Mount Cuba Center, which is a wonderful garden in uh, Delaware, uh, I think we have the finest collection of trilliums on the East Coast. Uh, and it's a really wonderful place to see a great diversity of this very charismatic flower uh, all in one place. And usually mid-May is the best time to go for these sorts of things. We have uh, wonderful displays of orchids as well. Um, our and our, our, some of our nature trails feature uh, quite an abundance of the pink lady slipper, um, which um, a few years back we did, a, uh, we did a survey of the number of pink lady slippers on the property and we counted upwards of 1200. Um, and then in some of the more cultivated areas, we've got really wonderful clumps of both the large and the small yellow lady slippers. And they're just really delightful and amazing. Uh, uh, um, uh, flowers that that you know are very uncommon and um, rare to see um, due in part primarily to habitat loss to deer pressure uh, and to some extent also to poaching um, and people like to dig these out of the wild and think that they can grow them at home um, and so um, we have some really nice ones that you can come and check out um, I have frequently asked what my favorite plant is, um, and I don't think I have a, a, a good question or good answer for that because it's really more what is my current plant crush? What do I like at the moment? Uh, and at this time of year, um, I really love ferns and particularly um, new fronds as they emerge. Um, I think just have a, a really wonderful details and spirals and uh, and. I appreciate them because it's a moment that's fleeting. Even a, a matter of a couple of days uh, will make a difference between seeing something very tightly curled up and then completely unfurled and expanding. Um, we again have a wonderful collection of different kinds of ferns um, and for all different sorts of uh, um, light conditions and soil conditions. Um, and I just really love how the ferns are so ubiquitous throughout the garden. And, uh, really add a wonderful kind of calming green texture uh, to many of the spaces. 
Again, now that it's warmer, we're beginning to coax a little bit more life out. Um, we certainly have lots of tree frogs that you can hear peeping away, uh, pickerel frogs now, and even a, a very healthy population of northern water snakes um, that tends to like to sun, they like to sun themselves on warmer days, sometimes in the middle of the path. Sometimes we're asked, um, why do we put fake snakes out to scare people? And then we have to wait a few minutes and then the snakes actually move and then the people scare themselves. Um, but um, they're not poisonous, they're not aggressive. Uh, and they're really, for me, a sign of um, good water quality and uh, a sign that there's enough food for these organisms to eat, which is really also important. Um, at, this, uh, at this stage also, lots happening in May. Um, we begin to see the emergence of the first of our spice bush swallowtails. Um, and uh, another really wonderful uh, smaller uh, butterfly that we've worked with uh, very diligently to raise here is the Baltimore checker spot. Um, the caterpillars that you see on the top right uh, can only feed on uh, a handful of host plants. Um, and they're unique in that they take two years in order to become an adult. So the first year they lay eggs, they become uh, smaller caterpillars. Uh, then they drop into the leaf litter and overwinter, and then they crawl up again the second season, uh, continue feeding, uh, spin this beautiful little uh, black and white and orange cocoon or chrysalis that you see, and then emerge out uh, as these uh, delightful uh, um, checker spots. And these are not giant uh, butterflies by any means. Um, the adult might be an inch and a half, maybe two inches at best. So Always lots to go and lots happening in May. Uh, it's probably one of our busiest times just because of the visitorship and everything's growing at once and there's so much to do that I find it's usually really important to, to try to find a few moments where you can just kind of take it all in and rest your eyes a little bit. So on to June um, and um, again, the, the floral palette uh, uh, begins to shift a little bit and moves away from the Curtis Woodland. Uh, down into our lily pond where it's a little bit wetter. Um, the woodland at this point has, again, a different set of rhododendrons that you can see off in the background um, that, uh, that really brings uh, some legibility to the landscape itself. Uh, and this is the flame azalea. Um, and flame azaleas, again, when you grow them from seed collected in the wild, uh, you get a whole different range of different colors from almost yellows to nearly reds and orange reds. Um, so they're really wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful shrubs. Um, at this point, we're also welcoming the uh, Catawba rhododendron, which is one that uh, grows down mostly in the Carolinas and the Appalachians, both in white and in pink, uh, along with um, a really wonderful and very fragrant uh, uh, azalea called the Pinkster Bloom, which has these really long, beautiful stamens uh, and, and stigmas that stick out, almost looking like eyelashes that come out of the, out of the shrub. So uh, again, the interest now shifting over more towards the lily pond where it's wet and where it's open. Uh, some of our, our um, yellow, yellow water lilies are here. Um, June usually marks the beginning of uh, lily season for us. Again, lilies, uh, I think were used to be much more common on the landscape, uh, but thanks to our, um, our dear friends are really becoming much, much more uncommon um, because they are greedily, uh, um, devoured wherever they grow. Um, we're fortunate in that about maybe eight years ago, um, we installed a deer fence around the entire 45 acres. And it's made a huge difference in allowing us to grow things like the lilies, the trilliums, the orchids that normally would have been eaten otherwise. So Canada lilies here, um, beautiful blue flag irises, uh, very special orchids like our little ca uh, calipogon all around the pond surface. And June's also a special month for us because we have, as a, as a little side project, we raise uh, giant silk moths. Um, and our, our, uh, our program involves uh, um, overwintering cocoons that emerge as these beautiful adults. Uh, they mate inside of specially constructed pairing cages. And then after they lay their eggs, we transfer the eggs to their appropriate host plants. And then our interns spend the summer nearly every day checking on the caterpillars and moving them along uh, to fresh, uh, um, fresh branches until they're large enough, usually by August, 
uh, in September to um, spin new cocoons, which we'll then collect and start the whole process over. So um, perhaps the most spectacular of this group is the Cecropia moth, which is North America's largest giant silk moth, uh, about four inches across in wingspan and just beautifully marked. Um, this is the caterpillar, uh, a little bit camera shy, uh, but uh, a real whopper when it's, when it's adults. Um, we also raise polyphemus silk moths and Prometheus silk moths. Um, and June is usually the time when most of these things emerge uh, as the weather is, is finally warm enough to, uh, to provide the right cues for these organisms to come out. And for us, the, the important part for our visitors is to connect the presence of these animals with the right kinds of plants. You can think of them as having uh, something akin to a dietary restriction. So they can only feed on certain kinds of plants. And if those aren't on the landscape, then you don't have silk moths. Um, the other thing that's really wonderful about this, these are primarily nocturnal creatures. Um, and so raising them in, in specially prepared cages, at least when they are adults, um, allows people to actually get to see these up close, uh, which you would really rarely encounter um, otherwise. And there's always other surprises to be found as well. Uh, a few years ago, coming down the path, uh, we, we met this beautiful lady here, um, a, uh, a common snapping turtle, um, probably about maybe 40 pounds, 50 pounds. Um, last year, she laid eggs just above our, uh, our lily pond and one of my staff members had the fortune of, uh, uh, the good fortune of being there when the eggs hatched and was able to see, um, you know, 20 to 30 little, uh, wonderful little snapper uh, babies coming out and heading into the lily pond. So in July, where we are currently, um, things again shift over towards our meadow, um, which is another open space um, and is full of lots of really wonderful plants. Um, there's just a little bit of an overview of the space. We've got a coastal sand plain display in the front and a little meadow section in the back here where we grow a number of different things, uh, including milkweeds. Milkweeds, of course, are important because they support monarch butterflies, but they're also beautiful plants. Um, and we like to try to champion some of the um, lesser known kinds like the world milkweed and the purple milkweed. Um, we also grow uh, federally listed rare plants. Um, Native Plant Trust has, as I said in the beginning, uh, a longstanding tradition of being a plant conservation organization. Um, and um, we um, have a really wonderful program, um, which is now approaching 30 years uh, old, uh, where we work with um, volunteers or citizen, citizen sciences that we call the, the plant conservation volunteers, along with all of the appropriate um, uh, federal and state entities in all six states of New England um, to collaborate on plant conservation priorities. And it's an important recognition that no one organization can do it all, but it's most effective if we collaborate and, uh, and, and partner uh, with each other. And so this NEPCOP program has, uh, we've been monitoring rare plant populations in New England, like I said, for 30 years now. We also maintain a seed bank of, uh, of rare plants, which would include plants like this Sebacea kennediana um, that only grows on sort of uh, um, the wet shores of, of vernal ponds and coastal plain, plain ponds in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And then it skips a lot of the mid-Atlantic and appears again in North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, so a really wonderful plant with very showy large flowers. Um, I'll take a, take a minute here to answer a question from Ariel in that we don't use pesticides. Um, so, um, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in fact, the, uh, um, the one of the images here is a good, is a good, uh, um, uh, good segue to this. Um, you'll see that white spider that is eating a, a little flower fly. Um, so this is a goldenrod crab spider. It is a beneficial organism. And in embracing a great deal of, of species diversity and functional diversity, we also host a lot of beneficial organisms along with some pest organisms. Um, for us, seeing a plant that might have some feeding damage on it, some holes, 
is not caused to reach for uh, some product or spray. Uh, it, in fact, I'd say we're happy that it happens because the plants are doing what in some ways they evolved to do, which is to support other forms of life. Um, so um, certainly there are other challenges uh, on a larger scale. So things like hemlock woolly adelgid um, uh, is not one that we manage particularly well because um, we don't want to spray our trees um, um, because the collateral damage is unacceptable. Um, so it's a give and take. It sometimes depends on, on the species, it depends on the pest that's here. Um, but I'd like to keep moving just because it's a, uh, um, um, we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, and um, sometimes I find telling stories about all the pest problems and challenges that our trees are facing, for, for example, is you know, it's rather depressing. Um, so Diane asks, how many rare and endangered plants are there at Garden of the Woods? Um, I'd say we probably cultivate somewhere, I don't know, in the hundreds of different kinds of plants. Um, some plants, rarity can be defined as something like this that is really uncommon nowhere and um, displays a high degree of fidelity to a, to a very specific habitat. Um, and then there are other plants that are rare because they are at the edge of their range limits. So, um, and I'll point out a few other ones like that. Um, and so, you know, growing these plants in the garden um, allows us an opportunity to interpret them and also talk about why they're rare, why are they threatened, uh, and to get people listening a little bit about our conservation message, um, which is just as important as, as you know, welcoming common plants into your garden. Um, so it really serves a great purpose, uh, a great function in that uh, many of our visitors are not going to um, go sort of bog hopping uh, on Cape Cod to look for Sebastia Kennediana, but you can come here and see it in person and marvel at its beauty and, uh, uh, and get some appreciation for it. And we hope that that translates into um, finding value in preserving the places where it does exist in the wild. So. Uh, moving on here in July, and this will be happening very soon, is the, 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 the first uh, of our summer sweets. And this is a wonderfully fragrant shrub that's found in uh, many of the wetlands around here. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, one of these things that reminds me of the, you know, the hot summers. This is another rare plant that we grow, the great St. John's wort, um, that is rare only because it just gets into Massachusetts, um, but it may be more common in the Midwest and the South, um, but it's a beautiful flower nonetheless, and a, quite a, a tall imposing plant at maybe um, six to eight foot tall, covered in these beautiful yellow blossoms. This is another plant that's rare in the wild in Massachusetts, but does exceedingly well for us here in the garden, so much so that we sometimes have to pull out the seedlings because they're a little bit too exuberant in our black cohosh. Um, back down in the meadow space, you know, the July and August is really the time of pollinators. Um, and so our mountain mints, and we have a number of different species of mountain mints, are just absolutely covered in different kinds of uh, um, beetles, wasps, cuckoo bees, um, all sorts of different kinds of bees. Uh, so it's really wonderful to see the diversity of pollinators are down there, just in the same way that our, uh, our Menarda here is host to a, a number of different uh, um, bumblebees, skipper butterflies, and even hummingbird clearwing moths. Um, so a really wonderful plant if you want to support uh, pollinators. Some other highlights from July, uh, down again around the lily pond, we've got the marsh phlox that's blooming uh, back in the meadow, uh, rexia, meadow pitchers, and the first of our golden rods, which for me is also a little bit of a sign that uh, we're, we're heading towards the fall season of golden rods and asters. Um, July, again, is an extension of the lily season for us with a slightly later blooming, uh, um, but uh, beautiful Turk's cap lily with the reflexive petals that kind of sweep backwards um, and, uh, and form uh, what, what would be akin to a, a mardigan or turban shape, uh, which earned it its name. A few other uh, um, highlights here, the American bellflower and downy skull cap. Um, and then August again, more of this riot of color and texture and form in the meadow. 
um, with New England Blazing Star. This is another true uh, um, New England endemic plant um, that is uh, listed in rare in New England. Uh, there's a few places in Maine where there's some strongholds of this plant, but it is not common uh, anywhere really. Um, and so we've got good displays of this. And then more common things like the New York ironweed and annuals like black-eyed Susans. Uh, another Minarda, which is really wonderful for pollinators, is the spotted horse mint and Minarda punctata. These really beautiful hot pink and silver bracts um, that surround the, uh, the wonderful little yellow flowers. Uh, and it's hyssop also coming into bloom now. In our rock garden, we have this really wonderful combination of nodding onion and uh, pearly, pearly everlasting. Here's your nodding onion. And then down where it's wet, uh, we begin to see things like the great blue lobelia, um, some water smart weeds, and another wonderful annual, uh, which is jewel weed, um, and definitely a big hummingbird magnet um, um, begins to show up. Similarly, uh, time for the cardinal flower, which is really uh, a really breathtaking red color. Um, the large, almost dinner plate size flowers of the marsh mallow or hibiscus uh, uh, moschutos. And uh, a little bit more diminutive, maybe only about an inch to half inch across, but beautifully detailed um, is the grass of Parnassus or Parnassia that you might also find around the pond edge. September brings us back over to the meadow where we're beginning to transition over to uh, asters and goldenrods. So our uh, gray goldenrods um, that you see in bloom here and New England asters beginning to take shape as some of the other ones are fading away. Um, Boltonia, white wood aster in the dry shady parts all throughout the garden. And New England aster again is a, is a really important uh, pollinator plant. Um, Flowering dogwoods beginning to show the first signs of, of fall color that are coming um, at this part of the time of the year. And our tour of goldenrods and, and asters continues with downy goldenrod, the sky blue aster, um, and then uh, wonderful things like our swamp sunflower and fringe gentian, um, just really wonderful plants. Uh, September is also a time for fruit. When fruit begins to develop, and it's certainly a time where we uh, start to focus on um, collecting seeds and fruits. There was a selection here from uh, viburnums and magnolias and the you know, diminutive uh, but lovely partridge berry. Again, lots of, lots of life still happening here is our goldenrod crab spider, different tussock moths. Um, we begin to see more of our woolly bears. And I can't remember what the, the, uh, the um, the myth or the legend of, of, of the woolly bear, um, what the proportion between sort of uh, brown and black means for how cool the winter or uh, how bad the winter might be. Uh, but there's some supposedly some connection there. The goldenrod crab spiders are truly amazing organisms. In the space of about three to five days, they can alter their uh, body colors to, um, to be completely yellow. Um, and uh, um, completely uh, uh, blend into a goldenrod, whereas back here, they're in the more yellow form um, and, and pinkish form. So um, really wonderful organisms. This is also a good time to see some uh, examples of parasitism in our woodlands. Um, many folks have probably seen the ghost pipes. They're, uh, um, they're flowering plants, um, but they don't produce any chlorophyll whatsoever. Um, they um, steal all of their sugars from the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi that are attached to and in relationships with our trees. And that's the same with the other two that are a little bit less common, uh, the hairy pine sap, which is kind of red, uh, and the yellow pine sap. Um, all three of these are present here at Garden in the Woods. Uh, and again, a good indicator of, of a healthy soil fungal population, which is really important. Um, for the functioning of the forest. October now begins to bring more fall color and sort of you know, wrapping up the end of the season here um, with, uh, with little you know, war warm days where it still kind of feels a little bit more like summer or fall. Um, the turtles still hanging out, still haven't quite uh, decided to go uh, and, and bury themselves in the muck for the winter quite yet, um, but all the signs are there, the seed heads of the grasses are there, 
the leaves are beginning to accumulate uh, on the Lost Pond Trail um, and the fall color is beginning to move in. And so um, at the right times, you have some really wonderful and colorful scenes here along of our trails, uh, um, which have that, again, here you've got the, the, the wonderful evergreen of the rhododendrons and the pines that contrasts with the hay-scented ferns. Um, the white walk here, again, beginning to show some of its color, sassafras and sumacs looking really amazing. Sugar maples, of course, and hickories, and the dogwoods really showing their, their, their fall colors at this point. More hickories and black maples, viburnums, um, very late flowering. And this is, again, another uh, a nod to Curtis's interest is our Frank Linnea. Um, Frank Linnea uh, is, a, is a, a tree that was discovered in the 1700s down in Georgia, um, collected a seed by um, Bartram and sent back to Europe, um, and then never seen again in the wild after that. And so it's been kept alive and propagated in cultivation um, uh, because there are no more natural populations of it. But it's got great fall color and really wonderfully late blooms, at least for us. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a nice little accent at that time of year. And then November begins, we get the first frosts. And I really love these, these uh, uh, kind of early frosty days because you can get these wonderful scenes where um, things like the beach plum and sweet ferns and gray birch and, and our bearberry are all just ringed in just a little bit of wonderful frost. Milkweeds will begin to blow around. And before you know it, most of the leaves are down. There's a few things hanging on and winter returns again. And so with that, I would like to say thank you for coming along on a trip through the 12 months and seasons of Garden of the Woods. Hopefully you enjoyed seeing some of the diversity of plant material and flowers and form and function that you can find here. Um, and I would encourage you all, if you're ever uh, out in the Framingham area or Metro West area to come and visit, we are open to the public from mid-April to mid-October. Um, but if you become a member, um, you can enjoy member walking hours. Um, so you can come in the winter as well and walk our trails as long as it isn't incredibly snowy um, uh, or treacherous and icy. Um, we're open and we love to see our members during the more quiet times of, this, of the season. Um, so with that, I will um, say thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, and thank you all for listening on this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, we have one question in the chat. Uh, and if anyone has some questions, now is the time to get them in. Uh, Stephanie asked, is there a type of sedge you recommend for lawns? Yes, um, we recommend um, oak sedge, Carex pennsylvanica. Um, because it spreads through rhizomes, so it will fill in and, and really create a dense turf over time. Um, and it's pretty, it's a, it's a tough plant. Um, you will need to make sure that it's watered well to get it established. Um, but once it's there, um, it, like I said, we mow ours once a year for an event that we host out there in the fall. And otherwise, um, we don't touch it. Um, there are lots of other ways that you can welcome more diversity into lawns as well. So the, the bluettes that I showed, the Quaker ladies in the very beginning are really wonderful lawn companions, along with many of our violets. Um, violets make great additions to lawns. They grow low, they bloom beautifully in the spring and springtime, um, and then they sort of fade away. Um, and uh, they provide crucial resources for uh, pollinators in April and May when there's not a whole lot else that's in bloom. Um, and I even say, you know, embracing things like clover, white clover in a lawn too, um, is, is actually quite beneficial. It's, uh, it's a resource for pollinators again, and because it's a legume, uh, it can fix its own nitrogen. So every time that you mow your white clover, uh, and if you use like a mulching deck in your mower, um, you're essentially fertilizing your lawn for free without any chemicals. Um, so uh, it's a really good addition. And um, I think that 
you know, putting greens belong on golf courses and not in your backyard. Your yard doesn't have to look like a putting green. Um, and, uh, and I think we could all stand to invite at least a little bit more diversity into our lawns. Think about shrinking it in the sense that, you know, maybe you have an area that's, that's difficult to mow or, or just a, a strange corner where you have to push the mower in and out strangely or, or awkwardly. Um, those are great areas to consider transitioning away from lawns into some alternative. You can still walk on it. You can still have a path if you need one back there. Um, but it makes mowing a little bit easier. And you spend less time mowing and more time enjoying your garden, which is kind of the point. All right. Uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions at the moment. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that um, regarding pests, you can always, you know, get get derailed into into terms of stories and anecdotes. Uh, some of them sad. Yeah. Do you have any? How about any funny anecdotes or stories regarding pest control? Hmm. Well, uh, I mean. You know, in the in the in the realm of of animal nuisances um, that we have here, um, we struggle with bunnies at times and raccoons. Um, I don't know if this is this would really qualify as funny or maybe just disgusting, but uh, raccoons often like to um, relieve themselves on top of things, whether it's a rock or a stump, um, and so they are not really shy about letting you know that they were there. Um, and a cursory investigation of, uh, of what they've left behind can tell you what they've had to eat as well. Um, but again, because we are, uh, you know, the, the garden is 45 acres and we're currently located in, in really in the middle of a uh, suburban subdivision. So many people who come say, well, why are you back in the neighborhood? And it's because this property was here long before the neighborhoods were built. Um, and so we do kind of act as, uh, as a sort of refuge um, here in the middle of, of a larger suburban area. And we have fox dens here, we've had coyotes uh, um, that have built dens and raised pups. Uh, obviously the owl we saw earlier, um, we had a breeding pair of broadwing hawks in the garden this, this year, um, red tail hawks, sharp shinned hawks, um, we've seen weasels, uh, fisher cats. So again, um, having this open space and the, the topography and the variety of different habitats that here um, really attracts a number of top predators to this space and they all help us with pest control. Um, the things that we that we that are harder to manage are things like I said, like the hemlock woolly adelgid, for example, or um, we've had a lot of trouble with beach related diseases um, and ash. Um, while we don't have emerald ash borer currently, um, we don't have a lot of ashes. I also recently heard that uh, spotted lanternfly, which is a big pest in the Philadelphia area and now in the New York area uh, was reported in Sudbury, which is just north of us. Um, so I think it's really a matter, not a, a, if we're going to see them, but a matter of when. Um, and, you know, like many, many pests, we've had issues with gypsy moth in the past or with spongy moth, excuse me. Um, and a lot of these pest cycles, there's kind of boom and busts where there may be a few years where it's really bad. Uh, and then things improve for a little bit and they get bad again. Um, and you know the plants adapt to some extent. Um, the beach problems are a little bit more serious. Um, we've had to remove a number of beaches because they uh, have completely died and then they become a, a, uh, a risk for our visitors and staff. I can't have you know a giant dead tree standing next to a path where a branch might fall down or something like that. Um, so you know there's a lot of I'd say sort of quiet behind the scenes uh, tree management and things, particularly over the winter months, uh, is when we try to get most of that done. Um, that sometimes involves the removal of entire trees. Um, but we also try to look at it as an opportunity with openings in the canopy. When that happens, um, there's an opportunity to plant uh, some new trees, to think about the future forest, um, and to think about what else we might introduce in terms of um, you know, tree diversity. So. 
trying to find the silver lining and all of that is also part of the process. Nice, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to to eventually make a trip and, and go out and visit you guys. Uh, it does not seem like we have any more questions in the chat. So with that, thank you so, so much for uh, sharing your time and expertise with us and showing off everything you have to offer. It's very beautiful. Thank you. I'm glad you guys all enjoyed it. Um, do please come visit. Uh, like I say, for, for spring flowers, um, you know, mid-May, early mid-May is peak season for us if you want to plan a trip. Um, otherwise, um, you know, September, um, late August, September is great for fall flowers and the beginning of fall color, um, which is also pretty spectacular here as well. Um, so please come and visit us. Um, we've got a great website too with lots of information. So please check that out as well. Um, and thank you all for joining me this afternoon. Thank you.